Yeah, we had some great front pages, and every other week seemed to be a tragedy, the pleasure boat tragedy on the river, and it was a great photojournalistic time, and I loved every minute of it. Um, but I did 13 years, and probably two or three years too many, and I was nipping out to do portraits because I, I couldn't ignore the photographer in me. And this is the first one I did for a series on the Saturday Review, and it's um, Iris Murdoch and John Bailey. And I love the way her pebble dash top matches the pebble dash of the um, building. I hated this picture when I first took it. I thought, oh, what a mess, that window and that branch and the pebble dash is. But now I look at it and I think, it works. We know they're in a cottage in uh, Oxford, and I love the feeling between the two of them. It's so, such an empathy between the two. And she wasn't very well then. I went to that job, and wherever you put your hand, wherever you sat, and wherever you put your hand, there was a glass of red wine. The trouble was, you didn't know how long it had been there, so you didn't want to risk it. John Hurt, the great John Hurt, who died sadly last year. I use a soft box, just one soft box, because... Um, I'm a great believer that if you go in there with loads of lights, you're worrying about them all going off. And I just, you know, obviously a great face like that. And um, he was a great man and um, very, very friendly. So I go in 180 on a Hasselblad with a, with a softbox. <laughs> this is Mel Brooks who gave me 30 seconds. He said, are you ready? I said, I'm ready. I said, are you just standing there all, without the comb in the hand? He said, are you ready? I said, yeah, I'm ready. And I had my softbox and whatever. And, and he, just, he just went into Hitler mode. And I got one frame, you know. And he said, you got it. That's it. That's a world exclusive. Nobody else has got this. <laughs> yeah, I said, yeah. yeah. The great Ken Campbell, a great man. Being in a theatre here, this sort of place that he may have appeared at one time. Great theatre, impresario, teacher. I went to do him in, um, out in um, Epping Forest. And he said to me, uh, I went to his house. And the first thing I noticed was a stench. The stench in his house was appalling. And I, he, I, said, I said, excuse me, sir, but you know, how's it to live with this smell? And he said, well, I've got these parrots, but I go on tour a lot. So I have to let them have the run of the house. He built this kind of wooden run all the way around. So I'm working with the parrot and Ken Campbell. And Ken's over the top, you know, actor, and, and he's making good pictures. And he said, do you want me to go and get my hat? And we love hats. We love hats and coats and sticks and whatever. And he came back with that. The most wonderful, you know, I've been working 20 minutes. You could throw all the rest away. And even the parrot's behaving, you know. And, uh, but it was, um, I mean, what's the definition of a hat? It's just wonderful. That. Great Seamus Heaney. Um, I think I have to hold my hands up here saying I was trying too hard. I love Seamus Heaney. He was like a, a, an uncle figure to me. I knew him quite well. And this is outside his house on a beach. And of course, the photographer in me is saying, the troubles, the wire. You know, and it, it was rubbish. I shouldn't have bothered because he is such a great man. You, you don't need to try too hard. But I couldn't resist doing the barbed wire. But I put it in as a mistake, really. Almost a picture of trying too hard. But... I love that custard pie kind of face he had, and uh, he's a great man. I put this in, uh, John Berger died recently, and uh, another person, you can imagine how nervous I was photographing John Berger, this great man of uh, ways of seeing, ways of looking, and whatever. But he was a pussycat, he was a failed actor, really, and he couldn't wait to act for me, and uh, so the hands are nice there. And this is the other one, this is the one we used on a poster recently. I'm rushing, I'm just aware that I want to keep going. Joyce Carol Oates. I flew to America, I flew into America, went down to Philadelphia, got a cab into this lovely house where she lives in the woods, and um, let the cab go, paid the cab off, and said, look, come back in an hour or something like that. Knock on the door, and she comes out, and she said, have you kept the cab waiting? I said, no, I thought I might just get 10 minutes, 15 minutes. She said, look, I can't stop, I can't stop, you can have one picture. I flew all the way to America, and you know, on the way home, I was so worried that she blinked, you know. But it does say America, you know, the hardest thing in our game is to locate people. You know, yes, this could be the Wirral, yes, it could be Colwyn Bay, but it looks Americana to me. And the thing is, she is so frail, so sparrow-like, 
like. And she writes on boxing. It's amazing that she has this sort of alter ego. But she's a workaholic. And, uh, you, you know, to try and... Any photographer in this room will tell, me, tell you, to, if you've only got 30 seconds, your whole body freezes. You know, will your lights go off? Will you, have you got your film in the camera? Will the camera work? Why a camera should stop working, I don't know, but we always think they're going to. Now this, I put this in, this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, Zadie Smith, I'm working, again, many people tell you that you get, go to do a portrait in a boardroom and your heart sinks, and you say, oh, not a boardroom. So you go into boardroom, I went into this boardroom, they said Zadie will be here in 10 minutes, and I found this lovely chair, and I thought, well, I got a chance. This chair is much better than the boardroom table and, and whatever. So I said, well, look, if I put her in there, I've got a chance. And she came in, and she just did a book on beauty, it was called On Beauty, and she looked stunning. You know, the, 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 the um, turban, and her uh, bangles, and whatever. And I put her in the chair, and now we're strangers, complete strangers. And the hardest thing to do is to photograph a complete stranger. You know, it's all right if you're going to go and do your sister or your mum or whatever, but imagine a stranger, and it's a very intimate thing to try and get a picture of somebody. And it's a privilege to be able to do it. But I'm sitting there with this beautiful woman in this office that means nothing to her, and I'm working, and she's sitting upright, and the picture is cold and sort of meaningless, but I've got her. And right at the end of this little session, I just said, look, could you lean back? Now, you could say, well, that's no big deal. Ask someone to lean back. You try asking a beautiful woman in an office to lean back and to, for her to trust you after five minutes. You know, it's a really big thing. And I now, you know, I mean, I suppose I thought to myself, if she says no, I've got the upright and it's okay. But all of a sudden, the picture becomes intimate we are at least friends now. You know, you look like a, fr a portrait taken by the family. Dare I say it, we're almost lovers. You know, there's something moved on. And we have a saying in portraits, in f p portrait photography, that somebody gives you something. You can not give some. You know, you can be awkward. And I'll never forget, I photographed Lou Reed. It was the most awkward sod I've ever photographed in my life. And he gave me nothing. Whereas this, there's, you know, it's not, I, I do a deal with people. I tend to say... Look, just sit here for five minutes and I'll let you go. And they love that. And I just got it. And I showed this in Hampton Court in the famous um, galleries there. And I was up against all these famous paintings. And they said to me, when do you think you ever captured beauty? And I've done lots of beautiful women. I've done, you know, Benoche and um, uh, Stevenson and all these great, beautiful-looking women. But this is the only time I think I really got beauty. And this picture is the opposite end. Yeah, this is uh, Sarah Lucas. This came about third in the, um, oh, what are those portrait awards? I've forgotten the name. But uh, Taylor, Wesson. Taylor Wesson, correct. You must have won. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I went to do Sarah Lucas, and she lives in Benjamin Britten's old house. And any photographer will tell you, portrait photographer, you go to a house and it's got a lovely old handmade swimming pool, you've got chances. And she came out and she couldn't care less what she looked like. If you, look, if you think of Zadie, very prim, very tidy, makeup, the um, headband and everything. And here's Sarah, completely honest with me, bruised legs, bruised arms, hair flopping all over the place. And I really loved this portrait. And it, it did come second or third, you know, if you can come second or third in that uh, competition. And it's because it's so different. Whereas if you like, I suppose the Zadie is almost what you'd expect a beauty photographer to do. Whereas this is a real portrait, and I've always been so grateful to Sarah for just showing me what she's really like at 11 o'clock on that morning or whatever it was. She couldn't care what I thought. And it, that's a, such an honesty, and we don't get enough of that. Because most times we photograph people who are plugging an album or a film or a book, and they make themselves you know, pretty and whatever. And I love the rawness of this. I can't stand her work, but I do like, do like the picture. There seems to be a lot of tights filled with weird soft stuff. I don't know what it's all about. But I didn't tell her. I didn't tell her. Colm Tobin, one of my favourite men of all time, uh, came into my little studio in Clerkenwell, covered in snow. And I, I just wanted to show this because of positioning. Two and a quarter, 120, you know, shoved to the right. You don't have to have everything in the middle. You can make good things with shape and form. 
And I swear to you, I didn't see that hole in his cheek when I did him because I could see the hat, the hands, and the wetness on the coat. I once went over to do his writer's room, and um, lovely, tidy room. And uh, next week, a month, I went over to do Anne Enright, who's another Irish writer. And she said, um, how long have you been with Colm Tober? How long were you with Colm doing the writer's room? I said the usual, about half an hour, three quarters of an hour, you get a cup of tea, you, t- you let loose in the room. And she said, well, you were lucky. It took five men three days to clear up his room before you arrived. <laughs> I'd love to have seen that room. Now, you let me down, Colwyn Bay. I've shown this to a girls' public school in rugby, and they all swooned. And uh, <laughs> I've taken this one, and then I took this one. I still don't know which one I like best, but he's a very pretty boy. And this is when he was making Coal Mountain. Um, and we've, I've used this a few times as a poster and things. Are we getting there? The police are in. I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alan Silito, bit of window light on a, on a porch. Um, you can't go wrong with a man with a black leather jacket and a pipe. And uh, just, you know, some days are diamonds. Some days it all just falls in and you, your heart skips a beat and you think, I don't need anything else. And the way, you know, that disappears into the black and there's mystery and the door suggests mystery and everything. And other days you can't see a picture to save your life, you know, uh, and you try too hard and whatever. But the best thing is just kind of relax and just do your own thing. I never plan anything except for the flying. I don't think I've ever planned a picture. But you go there and the door opens. When the door opens, you look around and you say, I've got to get them in that room or I've got to get them, you know, here or whatever. And on this one, this was just in his front hall. I didn't even go to his desk. I mean, I did photograph, photograph his desk for another thing. This is Henning Mankell, the great Henning Mankell. And I went over to Sweden to do this man. And he lives in on a little island in Sweden. He's dead now, sadly, poor man. Um, but I loved his books and, um, I, you know, that whole series. Um, and uh, I wanted to... Sh- to photograph a bit of Sweden. I, I, funny enough, one of these was in the paper yesterday in, in The Guardian. But I wanted to photograph Sweden. And I get there into a little wooden hut where the plane landed and whatever. And it was raining. And I, I shook hands with him. And he was very dour, a bit like that. He said, I'm not going outside. I said, sir, look, I've come from Lon- uh, London via Copenhagen versus via uh, Stockholm. You know, a long old trip. He said, I'm not going outside. I don't like the rain. I said, but I can't just do you in an airport terminal, you know. Please, can I go outside? And we, we, we struck up a deal. He said I could photograph him under any bridge on his little island. And this is the first bridge. But um, your heart does sk- skip a beat, you know, when they say you're not going outside. But uh, he was all right in the end. And uh, I, poor man, he may not have been very well then, to be fair. Frank Bowling, I, d- I work for the Royal Academy, do lots of artists. I love the detritus of of studios, and this lovely man, you know, it's about half ten in the morning, and I photograph him down in Brixton, and we get, we're getting on well, and I'm getting a few portraits and a few pictures. He was told he'd never make it because he was black. Never make it. He's huge now. Got a studio in New York, Chelsea and whatever, and an RA member. But he was told he'd never make it, and uh, he said, what time is it? And I said, about half past ten. He said, great, let's have a drink. And I have never drunk such strong rum in all my life. I got out of there at 2 o'clock, but no more pictures. It was just... Uh... There's a funny one. Um, Paula Rigo, great artist. I walk into this studio, and all her work is being, you know, on the background. That's obviously her paintings in the background. And the set is still there. So, you know, you wouldn't have to be a genius to say, if I can get Paula to sit in front of the work, I'd have my picture. And I said, do you still have that dress? And she said, yeah, we could find it in the props cupboard or whatever. Unfortunately, I was working with a great girl called Beth as an assistant. And Beth and Paula kind of wriggled into this dress and there's lots of pins and whatever. And as soon as she sat down, all the pins exploded. And that's why she's laughing, because there's no dress on the back at all. But I got my picture. And Maggie Hamling, she's a hard case, but... uh, that's the front cover of her book, actually. That I did, I did it for her book. Is that guy's name Jack, is it? Uh, Mac, isn't it? Mac, the Mac, the sculptor. That um, 
sculpture is made totally out of, of hangers. Imagine hangers, you know, imagine moving the hangers around to make a, a nude. And that's my lampstand he's leaning on. David Mack, David Mack. Great man, I just like the scarf, really. And this is a little bit from the Writer's Room series. You know, I just love these, you know, um, rooms that are crazily full of stuff, look like they're all going to sort of uh, collapse around my ears. This is my, my, Michael Holroyd. He did a whole thing on George Bernard Shaw. And he lives in the top of his house. And I went up and photographed his writer's room. And I said, have you ever tried writing with a computer? He said, well, I've got a laptop, but I don't know where it is. And then his wife, who's downstairs, Margaret Drabble, um, her room, her, t her table uh, where she writes, is in a, in a bay window where, uh, where um, buses and uh, cars go by. And I said, doesn't it put you off, you know, writing in a, on a busy street? And she said, no, she said, that's just where the removal men put my desk. So there's no logic to it at all. <laughs> Martin Amos. I remember this one, this is up in, uh, he now lives in New York, but this is in... Um, Haverstock Hill, and um, I remember when he moved in here, he told me a story, he said, when I moved in here, my son came over with a pack of sandwiches and a bottle of water, because he was, out, he was outside, that, in it, like an old garden shed type thing, and he said, mum said, now you never need to come in the house. <laughs> it's a bit sad. Anybody guess who this is? Will Self. Will Self gets off on words like a theosaurus and he writes all these kind of little labels. And he was doing a book about London and taxi drivers, so that's why the map of London. But I love the way he wore the floor out, you know, right, driving up and down on his uh, chair. And I think we're nearly getting there. Beryl Bainbridge, I love this one. You know, very gothic colours, all these dark colours. She was a great lady and... Um, the only house I've ever had to push my way past uh, a stuffed elk to get in. Um, and I went up and I found this one. It's got the Titanic from her publishers. She'd written a book on the Titanic. And it's got this gun. And she said, do you want me to move the gun? I said, no, it looks brilliant. Because it looks as though if it's going wrong, you're going to shoot yourself. <laughs> and she said, yeah, but it, all it was was that last weekend, my grandson was here. And it's from a box of toys. But it was there. I didn't put it there. It was there. It's a, you know, a bit of a homage to Leibovitz. I tried a picture here where I tried to make it look as though I'd photographed one of her pictures. But she was very interesting. She's scary, but interesting. Um, interested in the, my camera and whatever. But um, I don't know. It's a bit of a homage, really. I think people love or hate her stuff. It's either too elaborate and too set up. Or I loved her book on the uh, American blues. I, th I can't remember what it's called, but it's an American um, a book on... The, all the great blues singers in the South. It's fantastic. And it's worked when she worked for Rolling Stone. This is... Um, um, oh, K.P. Pierre Pierre. Is that, that's not right, is it? But it... D.P.C. Pierre. Well done. You get a free copy of the book. Uh, <laughs> no, this is... Um, you know, I, my job, funny enough, is the book of prize this week. And um, somebody on uh, Wednesday is going to have to go and chase the current uh, Booker Prize winner. My job, you know, used to be to go and get them. And I chased DPCP and I found him in a bar in uh, Chelsea the following morning, right? He'd been up all night. And I said, uh, from the Guardian, you know, to go with the interview, we're going to put you on uh, the front of the re review section and whatever. He said, I can't do it. I can't do it. I said, well, but I have to get something. He said, I can only give you one eye. So he gave me one eye. And, of course, the irony is, you know, he, I give, he gives me one eye from not wanting to give me anything. It makes a good picture. And you could only get away with it with him. Because if anyone knows him, he is a wacky, fairly sort of druggy sort of guy. And you can get away with it. But the irony is you get these pictures against their kind of will or whatever. And then two weeks later, they write to you and say, Hi, DPC Pierre, I'd love to use your picture on the cover of my book. Do you know what I mean? You go from not getting anything to, oh, please, can we use your picture on the book? And it did get for about a year, it was everywhere. But I love that eye, it's good. This is uh, the performance man, John Hegley, the poet. Um, great man. I get into his house in Islington and 
It's got these lovely colours on the wall, you know, sort of blues and reds, and then the flowers all matched it. And his wife said, look, he'll be down in a minute. I said, don't worry, I've got, you know, got plenty of light in here. I'm going to have a bit of fun. And he came down dressed in the same shirt as his background. You know, and I got, there's a great writer on The Guardian called Simon Hattonstone. He's, he's mad as a cucumber, but he's a great man. And I, I pretended, you know, that um, Hegley should give him the flowers. You know, pretend, pretend you're giving the flowers. And it works because he's a performance poet. You've got the glasses... Um, you know, the Costello glasses and everything, and the shirt, but I couldn't believe, I couldn't, you know, after a while, I couldn't distinguish between the shirt and the background and the flowers. It was all kind of merging in. Now, now I'm going to have to swear here. I, I warn you, people of a certain disposition. But it only works if I swear. <laughs> okay, this is the great Studs Turtle, right? One of the greatest... Uh, was that right time? Okay. This is one of the great... Um, American writers, uh, you, you know, imagine Spike Milligan on, on, on drugs. It's a bit like that, you know. Great writer, great radio man. And I went to photograph him, and he was not very well. He's been looked after by a carer. And um, I took some nice, nice respectful pictures, man in a blazer and shirt and tie, um, family on the stairs, another kind of cliche that we do. But I, I got a few pictures, and I thought, this is in Chicago, by the way. I've gone to Chicago. And he was getting tired, and we all agreed that the session was over and whatever. And he, and, he, and he said goodbye to me, and he went away. And then he came back, and he changed. He changed into, for my, to my eye, an American. You know, he now looks American. The, the jacket, the uh, little sort of squared shirt, the T-shirt, you know. And I, I said, Studs, I've got to do one more. Oh, he said, you photographers, you always want one. And I had a like around my neck. Why I kept it on my neck and not put it in my case, I'll never know. And I, I said, Studs, I've just got to do one more. And he said, OK. He said, um, are you ready? And I said, I'm ready. He said, are you ready? And he said, I said, yes, I'm ready. He said, fuck Bush. <laughs> <laughs> and I got it. So you've got to be prepared the whole time. And that I could throw everything else away, that one frame, and that is Studs Turtle. Imagine Spy Milligan like that. You know, you, you, you live forever off that picture. And that's the end of my little talk. Um, is that okay? Or do you want me to keep going? Or, oh, no, okay. Keep going. <laughs> oh, it's Q&A, yeah. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. We'll leave Studs up there. He's a good man. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. That's um, absolutely fantastic. Such a wide range of, um, of work, kind of top quality, every single one of them. Um, I just want to ask you one question, and I know you've been asked this question before, because I've asked you this question <laughs> before. Um, we haven't rehearsed this. This is the first time I've heard it. But you've, you've, during your sports photographer years, and all those iconic images that you've taken. And that profession has changed mm. vastly. Would you like to be doing that sort of work now with the situation that photographers and the pressure that photographers are under now with you know, getting pictures out within minutes to the world? Well, if, if, if you had a couple of editors, a sports editor and the editor of the paper backing you, and you went to a game, yes, I would. but. What I see, and Bridget might be able to correct me on this, it seems to me that at, I was, we were watching, some a friend was in here, we were watching a bit of footy yesterday, and there's 20 photographers around the pitch of a big game. And now, if, if Mourinho pushes Klopp, everyone's got to have that picture. And now, why, where I would argue was if that picture's on telly all night long, why do we need it in the paper? But it seems to me there's a fear of not having what was on Sky or BBC. Now, I would have never made a name for myself if I was up against that. And poor old Tom Jenkins, who, I, as I say, I've got a lot of time for, and I think he's a brilliant kid. But how can he get everything? Whereas in my day, I wasn't expected to get anything. It was almost, Amy McCabe's gone to the boat race, here's his picture. And that was a lovely freedom and a lovely confidence to have. I worry a bit about, say, from big football matches, maybe 2,000 pitchers come in, maybe more. And they just choose, people will choose what they want, and good luck to them. But how can you break through that? It must be really tricky. So I, the answer is no, I wouldn't. <laughs> I do, I do, like, I forgot to say what I love doing now. I love doing loners. 
I love doing poets, painters, writers. You know, the, the idea of what makes people tick. That's, I think I, as I'm getting older, I'm getting better at portraits because I'm getting older. And I love spending time with 80-year-old people, you know, and it's very important. Because when I was young, I was an observer. Music, sport, I was sitting on the edge of the pitch, edge of the stage, you know. Now I can say to Zadie Smith, lean back. You know, I couldn't have done that when I was 20. No way. Okay, I mean, you must have some questions out there. Can I ask, yeah? But could I ask you a question? Um, about yourself. Um, you've obviously had an enormous experience doing loads of stuff, but recently you, you can see that you're there doing the portraits. I'm going to ask a bit of an odd question. Do you feel as though you're beginning to understand yourself more as well? Yeah, I, th I think so. Uh, I I'm beginning to I'm beginning to become almost like a director, you know. I'm, I now feel as though I'm almost in charge. Whereas when I was a kid, I was in awe of people. You know, I don't think you can expect a 20-year-old kid to take an intimate portrait of a beautiful girl or a beautiful woman because you haven't got that experience. Whereas I think I have it now. What's the worst that could happen to me? You could tell me to clear off, and I wouldn't worry too much about that unless it was a commission or something. But uh, yeah, I am finding out. That's why the loners thing is interesting. I've discovered that I want to learn from them because we are loners. You know, we, we work on our own. And it's a pretty lonely place. And it's got even more lonely with digital. Mm. I used to go to uh, Metro Photographic in the middle of London, meet a few people, have a few beers, and we talk about the latest camera, the film at the time. We don't do that now. I'm alone. In, I live in Suffolk. I, I work away on my own in a little darkroom space or a, a space so I don't see anybody I don't you know I remember when I was young I used to love coming out of a darkroom and showing my wife a print of um, Mick Jagger or something so what do you think of this we are we are show-offs you know we're all show-offs I'm a Leo so it makes me twi twice a show-off but you know we want people to like us we want people to like our stuff but it's very lonely and I, I do get, I do worry about photographers getting depressed in a digital age where they're just working on their own and what, what's, what's going to drive us if I go and do a poet and he's been writing poems for 20 years and not sold any, you think, what's making this guy do this? And I hope some of that rubs off on me. And I'm jealous of these guys who do these, um, pro their own driven projects because they get up every day and do it. Don't forget the phone rings for me and I go and do it. You know, someone says, will you go and do? Will you go and do? And that's relatively easy. Um, but am I learning more about myself? I probably am and I probably... You know, I've reinvented myself three or four times. Music, sports, editing, portraits, and maybe now I'm going into more kind of landscape and whatever. I live in a very tricky part of the world because I grew up in a place that went like this. You know, uprights everywhere. I now live in a place that goes like that. It's just flat. And there's a group of us wandering around today taking pictures of old um, piers and stuff like that, things we like. But in Suffolk, nothing stands up. It's all flat. So next time I'm here, I'm going to show you a whole series of pictures of stones. <laughs> and maybe shells. But it's there. You can do it. You don't have to go to New York to take a great picture. You, know, you can take a great picture around the corner. There's a question somewhere in the middle, but maybe yeah. you've lost your nerve. <laughs> no, sorry. Was it? There we are. <laughs> no, I, I was going to simply ask about what kind of photographs gets you excited? And I think you've probably just answered that, really. It's uh, rather than being commissioned to go out with a camera, what gets the adrenaline going when you take the camera out on your own for yourself? Yeah, John was saying, well, you know, what, what gets me going? I suppose early doors, it was, it was music, and then it was, um, you know, the, the sport. And now I, get, I tell you where I get a thrill now. I, I took a picture last year of a set of gates which were overgrown. Now, I loved it. I stopped it. I, and my wife was nagging me like mad. She said, come on, we've got to go. And I took this picture of these gates on a 6 by 9 Fuji on film uh, in black and white. And we, I made a nice print of it. And last year, I sold three of them for 150 quid each. I'm so thrilled by that. Somebody likes my gates. <laughs> you know, that is, I, that is when you're really working, isn't it? You know, 
I, like if I photograph these glasses and I make a lovely picture and somebody wants them, I'm, I'd be so chuffed because it's such an abstract thing. I often wonder whether people like my pictures because it's Borg and McEnroe and, you know, the names. And when you get to somebody just to love your, like your stuff, enough to pay 150 quid, which is a pair of old rusty gates for 150 quid. It's, for, it's worth more than the gates. But that's when you're... Isn't that when you're sort of passing something on to somebody? You know, I love... Does anyone here know the work of Raymond Moore? Great photographer. And he taught me... I went on a workshop with him. He just taught me that there's beauty everywhere. And people will, you know... He was a poet as well and a musician. And in a way, those gates are my kind of my first step into that sort of world. And I was so excited by the fact that some... And the hardest thing is, what do you do next? You know, where's the other gates or where's the other whatever? So uh, keep taking the pictures.